Cyberpunk 2077 is a pretty big game. There's so many people to meet, places to visit, quests to complete, details about the world to uncover. It's staggering, but just like a mansion owned by a family of billionaire hoarders, there's bound to be some filth under the beautiful surface. That, of course, brings up an important question. Can you beat Cyberpunk 2077 without encountering any bugs or glitches? No. Wanna know how I know that? Sadly, I can't even show you. If you've gone anywhere on the internet in the last 10 days, you've undoubtedly heard about how the game runs on last-gen systems. And if you've seen my videos, you may know that I play on an iMac. I like to think CD Projekt Red knew a few of us morons would try and play on an iMac, because the problem of the game completely crashing my computer and forcing it to restart on its own, not just crashing the game, is as alive and well on here as it is on PS4 and Xbox One. My computer restarted itself while playing probably half a dozen times. I almost didn't even make this video, because I got 90 minutes in, the game restarted my computer, and the footage was gone. As it turns out, that was the best thing that could have happened. It seems as though Lady Luck flipped her hair in my direction on Monday, after the traumatizing experience I had, where I basically reversed guillotined myself with one of the 24-inch TVs I bought for my Wii Sports video. On Sunday night, in a somewhat inebriated state, I tripped over god knows what while moving a TV, and the bottom of my neck slammed real f***ing hard on the top of the TV with the full weight of my frame behind it. It was as awful as you can imagine, and my voice is still recovering from it as you can probably tell. However, hopped up on painkillers, I launched Cyberpunk 2077 once more, and the real game began. But first, more importantly, the Mitten Squad Christmas Sweater Sweatshirt and Christmas Sweater Family of Products are still for sale, despite the Christmas delivery window being closed. The sweatshirt and blanket are as beautiful in person as they appear online. In the interest of helping as many people as possible find their Christmas spirit, you can use the promo code 2077 to get 10% off any Mitten Squad Teespring product but that promotion ends on Christmas Eve at 11.59 p.m. EST. So you've gotta act fast. Or you don't. It's your money. Spend it how you want. I'll tell you real quick that this video contains spoilers for the entirety of Cyberpunk, so if you don't want to be spoiled, you best skedaddle. After choosing Easy and a Nomad as my race, I began making someone as true to me as I possibly could without wanting to put time and effort into making it actually look like me. It lacked the balding hairstyle and overly protruding eyeballs, but I got pretty not close at all for only 3 minutes of time. Because I had no idea about anything in this game, I went with what I thought was a fairly balanced, if maybe a little combat aggressiveness oriented set of attributes. I've had my car battery stolen enough times to know that all you've gotta do to fix Lightning McQueen is rip out a cable, turn him on, and he'll get you to the ends of the earth. Sheriff wasn't overly fond of my attitude or my unwillingness to get him a mater autograph for his son. I left, did some far cry nonsense, and met up with Jackie Wells, a man with a package the size of a large package. He's got the cargo, I've got the wheels, he's got the nicely shaped skull. I knew right away that we were a dream team. Our trip to the border went rather well, aside from me somehow f***ing up a U-turn worse than anyone in history probably has. I'd hoped to just ram through the gate because this is an open world game with choices, but Cyberpunk is to open world games as Meow Motors is to feline kart racers. Don't ask what that means. I'm still not sure myself. It was a good thing the border guard had glow sticks in his eyes, else he wouldn't have been able to read the sheet I gave him or the dollar amount on the bribe I slipped his way. The first of at least two double crosses occurred here when they sent a fleet of the world's worst police officers to stop us. In their defense, they were about as good with their guns as I was with mine. What was the cargo, you might be asking? A lizard who seemed not too pleased about missing out on a high five. Then there was a cutscene that shows you getting antiquated with Night City. Dancing, armed robberies, getting settled into a new apartment, and we get squeezed out in the second trimester ready to tackle our first real job, rescuing a client who's been MIA for hours. As this is still basically the tutorial section, combat is nothing to sniff a stick at. Doing the whole shooting thing with guns never gets much more interesting than it does here, but later on, with perks and different weapons and hacking and sh it becomes a bit more interesting. Good old Sandy Dorset was having a wonderful time dying in the hot tub when I showed up, 
stuck a stim pack in her chest, and delivered her into the loving arms of the American healthcare system, who would never let someone sit and wait for three hours to get a CT scan, all the while they might have done serious damage to their neck by hurting themselves with a f***ing TV. As we escaped, Wakako, our intermediary for this particular mission, politely informed Jackie and I that the city was on lockdown. Guess we know when this game is set, don't we viewers watching this in the current year? Back at my apartment, I stashed some garbage in the weapon closet. All good Michigan apartments have a weapon closet. I happened to keep my five Wii's in mine, and I drove Jackie and myself to Victor Von Victor's house, the finest ripper dock on this side of whatever street he happens to be on. He set me up with some flex tape on my right hand to hold my gun better, and some new and improved eyeballs that have computers built right into them. Like Google Glass, but not a waste of money. While I was getting plastic surgery to make the lovely Paulina even more beautiful, Jack spoke to Dexter Deshawn, another fixer who's got lofty goals and the way to back it up. We're gonna steal the most valuable item from the world's most powerful family. But to steal it, we need an itsy bitsy spider robot that is more than capable of making people scream and shout. It probably goes without saying that I'm gonna be glossing over if not completely ignoring a f ton of stuff I did throughout this run because I don't want this video to be two hours long. Evelyn Parker's the girl I'm after at the moment and she resides in a bar during the evening time. Inside the bar, we discuss the plan, of which she is a vital component seeing as she knows that the biochip I'm after is tucked away in a top floor suite in Kempaki Plaza. Blasting your way inside the building would be like trying to sneeze down the Great Wall of China. The building itself will crumble and fall away from the bulldozer that is time before we get any anywhere near the chip. But technology, and the power of imagination, saved the day once again. I'm still not 100% sure what a brain dance is. I can only assume it's like when I said I wanted the ghost of Margaret Thatcher to stick her tongue in my left ear, wrap her tongue around my brain, and come back out my right ear. The point of this here experience is to get you accustomed to being an editor for a YouTuber with 11 million subscribers who pays you with exposure and free merch. You learn the ins and outs of editing within Squidward's dream level for Battle for Bikini Bottom. You can scan various items, sounds, and heat signatures to expose details the average viewer would miss. With the training round over, I watched Evelyn play Pop Goes the Weasel with Yorinobu Arasaka's favorite sausage, saw where he keeps his favorite toys with help from T-Bug, explained to Evelyn that my knife isn't big enough to get all the way through Deshaun's thick back, briefly became world famous super cop slash murderer Milton Squid, and met with Meredith Stout, a woman whom I tried to blackmail for more information about how to proceed with our grand scheme. Yeah, she really was not a fan of the blackmail idea, but she did provide me with a credit card I'd need to get the spider robot from the Maelstrom Boys. I did my first and only successful hard shack, and Jackie and I entered the Maelstrom hideout to strike a deal. To say that this didn't go as planned would be the understatement of the 27th century. Royce, their new leader, was disrespectful towards me, which prompted a similar response from me. As the saying goes, violence begets violence, so I stuck a bullet under his tongue and let the games begin. I won't lie, in this firefight through their compound, I regretted playing on easy. I probably could have changed the difficulty, and possibly probably should have, but I didn't. I'm too stubborn for that. I chose to exist in my own disappointment, rather than taking the necessary steps to fix something. Never did find the Slab King, though. Back at the Afterlife, the meeting ground for all sorts of nefarious characters including but not limited to exclusively me, Jack and I shared a drink named after a certain special someone named Keanu Reeves who shall remain nameless, and we entered the hyperbolic time chamber to go over the plan with Dexter and Dee Dee. Short version is, Jack and I are posing as international weapons dealers and lovers who are on our honeymoon at Kempaki Plaza. The plan is set, all the pieces have been assembled, all that's left to do is flip the goddamn board and start anew. We donned our suits without a tie, entered the hotel, and I'm not saying that, why did I write that twice? The first obstacle was the receptionist. Social interactions with people who might not be people are a bitch. If you've ever asked the UPS virtual assistant its favorite color, then called it a c for not answering the question, you'll know exactly what I mean. While Jack went up to the room, I was busy failing the challenge properly. Some dip sh left their phone floating right in the middle of the hallway. So now, we can properly say, with actual evidence, that you cannot beat Cyberpunk 2077 without encountering any bugs. Though I've got a feeling you've probably seen more than a few already. Regardless, this isn't the type of challenge where I restart if I fail. What this 
this really is, is clickbait. I thought if there was ever going to be a game where what I do is effectively a no challenge run, this would be the one to do it in. If you feel misled, I implore you to hit the dislike button. Inside the hotel, stage one began. I used the power of hacking and eyesight to navigate the buck through various rooms to get it to the net agent. Psst. That's a fancy name for the obese 45 year old man watching the cameras. While I got a brain dance earlier, this lucky guy got a special dance of his own. A few hours later, Bug got into the system, and Jack and I made our next move by taking the elevator up to the penthouse to snag the biochip. They say that the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray, but there are no real men in the future, and mice have been extinct ever since the Ratatouille uprising of the summer of 31. From the safety of a maintenance shaft, we watched the unthinkable unfold. Saburo Arasaka arrived to give his son a scolding. I've always thought that a swift backhand across the face was a better disciplinary measure than hurtful words. Then again, I laughed when I got spanked as a kid, so I'm probably not the best person to speak to on such matters. Yorinobu went and off daddy, told his guard to lock down the building because he was poisoned by our enemies, Bug went and got herself got, leaving Jack and I to take to the skies in an escape attempt that was really a colossal f***ing disaster. To secure the safety of the chip, Jack did what he did best, stuck something in a hole in his head. Then came the actual escape, and because this is a video game, there are dozens of ways you can go about getting out of the building. You can shoot your way out, or you can be sneaky. I love options. I tried the sneaky path for a while, but lacked the skills, perks, and mental fortitude to do so. So I turned to violence as the answer. What with this being the California hub for the Arasaka family, it's among the most fortified buildings in the land with enemies who don't f*** around. Predictably, there was a pretty substantial bug that kept me from progressing. An enemy I had to kill to obtain a key fled the scene and was a solid 4.5 kilometers away. With no way to get him, my only option was to go back several minutes in time and run through the entire combat sequence as quickly as possible to keep the little b from running away. Down on the main floor, I was so incredibly disappointed by an LMG I'd found earlier. A handful of EMP grenades did far more damage against the sentry bot than the bullet hose did. That's what people who are good at video games would refer to as using an enemy's weakness against them. It's a useful thing to do, which is why I don't do it very often. A mitten prime example of that is how I used a silenced handgun to clear out the garage rather than entering the car to make a speedy getaway. My little rampage did not come without a price. Jack got a bullet to the liver in the process, and unfortunately his is not nearly as healthy as mine. I could tell you what happened next, but showing you would be easier. That's right, Jackie Boy went to be with my dead dog in the big server in the sky, and Deshaun, not at all thrilled with the death of the Emperor, gave me a free bullet as a parting gift, and I awoke inside a dream of another life as a rock star with a metal hand. I've always wanted to be Captain Hook. After the show, the gang and I rode the vertebra towards Arasaka Tower to finish the fight in the past. My guess is that the combination of the absurdly overpowered gun and the fire hand are meant to show how good Johnny Silverhand was at what he did, but I wasn't into it. I then planted a bomb, Adam Smasher planted something in me, I hope it's a baby, and with a mushroom cloud coming over the horizon, Subaru Arasaka ripped my soul from my body. The real me woke up in a ditch somewhere, was saved by Takamura, Saburo's bodyguard, and another escape began. For a moment I thought the mission glitched. My weapons seem to do practically nothing against the ninjas sent to end us. But it's all a part of the game. Also, I forgot to mention that after Jack died, I stuck the chip in me. Sloppy seconds never hurt anyone. Both Takamura and I were gravely injured, myself more so than him. Good old Vic patched me up and broke the news as gently as he could. The ghost of a bad actor is haunting my brain and is going to kill me. That was a joke. For the love of God, don't cancel me. He gave me the same pills my doctor gave me after I f***ed up my neck. I could either take them to prolong the suffering like a real gamer, or end it all quickly by letting the voices take control. Still mad after hearing someone pronounce Trilogy as Trilogy, I refused to help anyone named John in any way whatsoever. Not that I really had a say in the matter though. Johnny Boy's trapped in my mind with me, and we either find a way to get him out, he takes control, or we both go to a family dinner at the Golden Corral 
also known as death. Back in the saddle, I put on my fedora and a scouter like a good little gamer, sold a bunch of garbage, and met up with Takamura at a restaurant to see what he had to say. Evelyn's the key to unraveling this ball of yarn, according to him. Anders Hellman's mayonnaise is also connected somehow. While he called in some favors, I got to work tracking down Evelyn and or Mr. Mayo. I assumed, because the game told me to talk to her, that Judy Neutron would have all the secrets. And the game was right, Evelyn's a whore working in the Cloud District. But I imagine you don't get there very often. Before entering the club, I took a quick detour to see how this game reacts to terrorist attacks. Not as well as I'd hoped. Realism comes at a cost, it seems. I also couldn't kill the guy who only appears in my eyes. That's another point for realism. Silly me accidentally chose a man whore to spend my time with. It's too bad there's no way to reload a save to make a different choice. I played him like a fiddle, made him regret ever coming into work, snuck my way into the VIP room, and interrogated Tom, one of Evelyn's lovers, for more information. He pointed me towards Woodman, who was not too thrilled to see me kneel down to speak to him like he was a sick child who just got diagnosed with toddler Alzheimer's. I'm pretty sure this was the first boss fight of the game. It paid off. I got a pretty snazzy automatic rifle from his body sack. Initially, my plan for leaving was to mix things up try shooting my way out. Unfortunately, I had not taken my own stupidity into account. In the heat of battle, I relied too much on the minimap and forgot to just take the f***ing elevator to leave. Then I remembered the elevator and couldn't leave because of the implication. Finally free, Johnny explained Soul Killer, where he died, Mikoshi, you know, all the stuff I probably haven't mentioned yet because, like I said, there's a lot of ground to cover here. I can only assume that Johnny's plan was to talk to Rogue about tracking down Hellman. I say that because I lost more footage to another computer restarting crash. I didn't exactly do the same things in the next go around, but we still got where we was going. Rogue's price for info is 15,000 Ed Boys. Got another glitch on the way out. This game just keeps getting better and better. Luckily for me, stopping violence with even greater violence rewards a hefty amount of currency from police, and Wakako still owes me for the biochip job. Wasn't as much as I'd hoped, but it still put me within striking distance of my goal. What pushed me over the river and through the woods was running over grandmother with Lieutenant Lawnmower, a tough criminal who just so happened to cross my path when I tracked her down to murder her. A couple more cheap crime syndicates were eradicated on my way to cash in my Chuck E. Cheese tickets for cheap body augmentations. I dumped off barrels of currency into the Rouge River to send it to Zug Island to be burned, got information about Hellman, and a new problem occurred. After being f***ing aggravated by my computer restarting and corrupting my recordings, I swapped over to a capture card and my second computer. What I hadn't even considered was Cyberpunk infecting my MacBook with more bugs. The Elgato capture software just froze like a snail caught committing armed robbery, which means I lost about another 30 minutes of gameplay. You didn't miss much. Rogue pointed me towards Pan Am, who of course wouldn't help me unless I helped her first. That's how games work. Also, you will probably notice dark parts of the game being much darker than before. Nothing I can do about that really. I'm gonna try to fix it with editing, but I can't guarantee it. What you see is the best I could come up with. With Pan Am supplies loaded into her car, we rode to an abandoned town to lay an ambush for the group that stole her truck. I got flung about 650 feet when I tried to jump into a window. It happened twice, actually. When the clan arrived, we lit up the town like a Christmas ham. I massacred everyone in the finest display of firearm handling anyone's ever seen. We got Pan Am's truck back, and we stormed the Raffin hideout to kill them all, because that's what good Americans do. When you're down and out with the bases loaded, genocide is the answer. As I've already said, there really isn't much to talk about with combat. It's the kind of game that's much more interesting to play than it is to watch someone explain. It's worth mentioning that in the gunfight that broke out, aside from realizing how truly god-awful the ground looks on the lowest settings, I got an energy rifle that can shoot through walls. This carried me for a long ass time. With Pan Am's goods delivered to the interested customers, we had ourselves a celebratory drink. She revealed herself to be an alcoholic, which is probably why I despise her as a character. Alcohol is for weak-minded simpletons. Ignore the pile of bottles that are easier to measure in square feet than the number of bottles. Now that we have her truck back, we can get down to business. There's an AV, that's short for Airborne Vehicular, that's gonna be passing over a power plant and Hellman's on board. All we have to do is sneak into the plant, rig the system to detonate an EMP, and I'll be ready to spread Hellman's blood on my sandwich in no time. Of course, no plan can go off without a hitch. The EMP mostly worked, and Pan Am nailed it with her flying bomb. But Mitch and Scorpion, 
two of her closest Aldecaldo clanmates saw the bird get shot out of the sky and went to investigate, not knowing it was armed by Kang Tao Robo soldiers. She tried to warn them, but, you know, we just detonated a fing EMP. This is why all EMPs have a warning on them to ask for your parents' permission before detonating. You gotta do it right or everything's gonna go wrong. Pan Am pretended to be Jack as we neared the downed AV, meaning it was up to me to clear the area. That rifle I got charges up when you're aiming down the sights to deliver a powerful shot, and with the addition of a scope, it made quick work of all my foes. Scorpion was nowhere to be found, his body was probably crushed under the weight of my ego, but Mitch was alive and well, despite being a hostage. The remaining Kang Tao forces took Hellman to a nearby gas station for storage. Getting in was a little tricky, so much so that I died. Pretending to be Rambo is not always the best course of action. Sometimes blinding yourself with a flashbang is the only way to see the light and learn what you must do. I had to knock out Hellman, he had hell in his name, Pain was always in his future. As Takamura journeyed to the motel, Hellman and I had a little conversation. He learned me that the only reason I'm still alive is that Johnny Silverhand, the resident living in the chip inside my head, saw an opportunity to do an at everyone ping inside my head right as I died to summon everyone back to their posts. Except he invited a bot into the server while we were away, and it's only a matter of time before Johnny has full on owner privileges. That was the dumbest fucking reference I could have possibly made. I hate that I wrote that. In the time it took me to have an out-of-body experience, Takamura teleported three kilometers away, despite just being in the hotel when I left. I really do like this game. It's easily one of my favorite games of 2020. Not that that's very high praise, since I've only played like four games that released this year. My point being, I know it's a game, but that teleporting thing annoys me. It would have been incredibly easy to add an invisible timer to let Takamura or whoever else relocate somewhere else, even if they still just appear there later. My other complaint is the opposite of that. Driving off-road in a sh car is sh Who would have thunk that? On the way back to Takamura, I did away with some bikers with a few grenades. A few cops didn't like that. Maybe I was confused and only thought they were bikers. Maybe they were kids playing on bikes. Either way, I took one of those bikes for myself, lost the fuzz, and met Takamura's contact, Oda. See, Taki wants to tell Saburo's daughter Hanako who really killed her brother, and Oda is her bodyguard. He was not very convinced. He said I'd bring death to my door. Little did he know, I'm a door-to-door -door, door salesman. That might have sounded cooler without the extra door at the end. Takamura has yet another plan, and it's his best one yet. They're throwing a parade in Hanako's honor, and he's gonna infiltrate her parade float. I get the sensation he's always wanted to be inside a giant holographic fish in the sky. I can't say I blame him. Hakako gave us a shard containing the exact routes and positions the float will take. The rest is up to us. While he tracked down more leads, I f***ed some dumb whore, crashed into a pole, and got to work taking care of more pressing matters. Mr. Hands, a fixer who introduced himself to me over the cellular after I left Clouds looking for Evelyn, has managed to get me in touch with the Voodoo Boys. They run Pacifica, one of the many regions in Night City. I was not told why meat, only meat, and so I meet. His name is Placid, like Flaccid, only I can imagine that he's not with that knife in his hand. Together, Placid and I went on the longest power walk of all time, to his desk, which is weirdly right here and not at all what I was expecting. He gave me a job. There's a van in a mall and he wants it. My job is to get in there and make it happen. Inside, I went for the stealth option because I dealt with a few goons outside and they were no pushover, and because I couldn't think of any good way to sneak through with how many people were in there. Did I just contradict myself? That's fine. So I blew my cover and holy f hitchhiking Jesus, what a mistake that was. People everywhere, dozens of them, all tough as sh**, but none tougher than Mr. Shit himself, Polly, Matilda, K. Rose, the Sasquatch Lombardi. The big idiot pinned me against the wall and beat me with a hammer. It's like preschool all over again. Damn you, Tyler, and your piece of sh** toy hammer. After the squatch died, I had to contend with the leftovers, the scraps, statistically speaking, the majority of what remained. That energy rifle really tenderized my bacon inside the mall. One to two shots was all it took to kill most people. They fell one by one, but one remained, the agent hidden in the cinema playing unconscious dental patient simulator. Actually, he wasn't unconscious. I wrote that as I was running to the room, but I liked it, so I'm leaving it in. The network agent let me in on the game. Me, I'm being played by the voodoo boys. They injected me with a virus while I was plugged into their system and used me as a catalyst to off every agent in their system. It was a good plan, except they didn't count on me being the protagonist of this story. Placid was not informed of the plan I laid that involved me surviving and returning. 
Bridget the Digit arrived just as Placid was leaving because he knew choosy moms choose Jif, but he's more of a gift guy. She offered to buy the chip for money and stuff, but didn't understand how Johnny and I were still two pickled sausages in a corn stalk. She can help me with what I'm not sure. Let's just say that Paul writing this is having a difficulty understanding big concepts at the moment. There's a black wall set up by Netwatch all around the cyberspace. I gots it now. Alt Cunningham went beyond the wall at the end of the series. Johnny needs her, forgot to mention that, and Bridget can get me inside the cyber. One second of chilling in an ice bath like I did after soccer matches in high school. Didn't play soccer though. Next second you're in the universe where everything that exists is the sick bastard child of a drunken fuckfest between a pin screen and a light bright. Bridget was about to tell me that I should only take a minute to find the alt clone when bedtime came, but I still had my cool lava lamp plugged in. Then another dream, because it's time to sleep. Alt Cunningham's a woman. Gotta be honest, I thought it was a middle-aged man. She got mugged by the Arasakas, kidnapped really, and Johnny rounded up the usual suspects. We've got Rogue, Tank Dempsey, Squidward, and Macho Man Randy Savage himself, Santiago. Then a combat sequence which was as bland as the first one, and driving combat with this pistol is as uninteresting as everything I tried to come up with for this joke. We laid a plan to storm Arasaka Tower to rescue Richie Cunningham. Big ass concert followed by a terrorist attack. As my children's children used to say in the future, the music of the 2050s is satanic. It's gonna cause trouble. More combat, who gives a shit? Yoshi got his head cut off, and Cyberpunk subverted our expectations by not having her come back to life after having her soul leaked on 4chan. It's amazing to have a twist right after subverting our expectations. Dangerous too could lead to pulling a muscle in your make-believe moral high ground. Next stage in video game is traveling to the black wall, but I must go alone, for I alone am stuck in the shitty Windows XP screensaver. Alt's here, ban her, JK don't, she's my cousin, I invited her here. Johnny's here too, we had ourselves a little chat about digital style and how to get Johnny out of me. I think this is another one of those big brain concepts. We gotta get her to Makoshi and she makes an engram of me, rips Johnny out, stuffs my Johnny in his place, and I live happily ever after. TLDR, Bridget lied to me, so she and her entire family had to die. Some of them were so eager for it that they welcomed it. Placid's body finally went limp when I robbed him of his life. I took a tumble for the second time this week, and had the game ruin what should have been an emotional moment where Johnny 2x4 and I talked about what it's like to die. After all that pussy crybaby sh**, Takamura called me to meet. He's got the bug, and he's not even wearing a mask. To make sure the bug worked, I performed a small test which consisted of pressing X, pressing A, pressing X again, and climbing a ladder. We tried to grab a snack too, but he wasn't interested in eating his croquet balls. Here's the plan. I'm pretty sure I explained it to you earlier when I didn't mean to because at that point in the story you didn't know it yet. What is even happening to my mind? Anyway, cyberpunk and whatnot. The parade. Takamura's handling getting on the float, and I'm taking out three snipers who will be watching from the rooftops, waiting to put a bullet in my doorbell. While he reconnoiters the area, I had time to kill. Literally. This is that time thing I mentioned earlier. What does that mean? To pass the time, I thought suicide would be a fun thing to try. The best suicides are the ones you don't see coming, like an accident involving tripping on nothing and falling neck first onto a TV, or opening fire in a restaurant full of high level movers. Mobsters hate this. Even with my fancy wall penetrating without protection electronic energy projection weapon, I never succeeded. I spent longer than you'd think on that too. Tried a couple different tactics, running in hands first with a shotgun, throwing grenades inside the building, and having half of them get stuck on the door frame. I tried everything I could possibly think of and nothing worked. Outraged at my own failure and inability to kill a simple mobster like a man, I went to the police. Not to ask for help to kill them. I'd gotten a job from some rando who spent his life savings to watch someone get hit, and he died on the scene when they opened fire back at us. The life of a Discord moderator is never easy. Still needing something to do, I thought to do a right and proper side quest. Believe it or not, I did do quite a few of them in this playthrough. Haven't met Elizabeth Perilis yet? Wonder what her story is. Made a boo-boo with my bike and that was the end of that idea. The next side mission I actually did was all story, no action, no reason to spoil it. Then again, if you're this far into the video, you probably don't care about spoilers. Well, I do. So moving on to the bullshit. This stage of this quest, 
like possibly all other quests in this game I imagine, can be bugged. In my 90 minute playthrough that's lost to time, I couldn't pick up a dead body in the tutorial. Had to restart the game. After, like, so long, my friend finally called me. It was so good to hear his voice telling me about all the silly things he did yesterday, like when he with the Now it's go time. My job is to infiltrate the Arasaka industrial plant and hack the system. First half, you know, a few parts took some real effort to get past. The big warehouse was probably the hardest stealth section in the game so far, but even then it's nothing above average. It's one of the not many I experienced where I couldn't just blindly bumble around and not get caught. Then, guess what? Bullshit. Round 2, Return of the Nightmare on 21 Shit Street. This time, for real, for the third time ever, I did a side mission because it was moderate difficulty and far away. Saul, the leader of the Ullman Boys, was abducted, possibly against his will. As usual, it falls on me to get inside and get Saul out. I'm not 100% sure if stealth was required. Pam made a fuss when I got detected so I'd assume not, but this was slightly behind the last one. No real reason to say much about it. Only so many ways I can say I strangled someone to death. Saul and I escaped, ran into the loving arms of a deadly sandstorm, were rescued by the van. We sought refuge in an abandoned building, and Pan Am refused my advances. She'll regret that one day, trust me. For saving her dear leader, she gifted me her rifle. I used it once, maybe. Takamura was set. I attempted suicide twice only to realize that telling him not to jump is a thing you can do. He gave me a shard containing the locations of the snipers. The parade began, and I got to work performing three assassinations on three unlucky individuals who were just doing their jobs. Getting in the way of what I want is enough to deserve a death sentence in my book. Let this serve as a warning to everyone. I want Kirby Air Ride 2 and I'm gonna get it one way or another. Sniper 1 was as hard to look at as he was easy to kill. I made sure to drop his body down onto the streets below to dispose of it discreetly. People don't spawn down there. It's safe. Had a bit of parkouring to do on my way to the second sniper. Part of me is surprised there weren't more sections like this in the game. I'm not sure why I expected there to be a lot of rooftop running in Cyberpunk. With Bravo 2 down, only Bravo 3 remained. The B stands for bad guy and Bravo. A watchman on the stairs kept detecting me before I could digitally gouge his eyes out. It took several attempts to take care of him. Sniper the third planted three mines behind him for safety. They saved him once. I interrupted the Netrunner's gaming time, and Sandy Uya emerged with his lightsabers to end me. It went about as well for him as trying to beat Super Monkey Ball 2 without collecting any bananas went for me. It was an unrivaled tragedy. Then Takamura went and f***ed everything up by shooting Hanako where her heart should be. Thankfully, he only knocked her out and changed her clothes while she was unconscious. He's a real gentleman. The game restarted my computer again right before speaking to her, like going home to play tech support for my family, the fun truly never ends, no matter how badly I wish it would. The next time the game held it together, she was unwilling to listen to reason, refused to believe her brother who was labeled as a smug cock by his co-workers, and even managed to make one of them cry by telling them, try not to f*** up this order if you can manage that, will kill someone for power. Police raided the place, Takamura had one of the most pathetic off-screen deaths ever, the floor collapsed, which I felt was too convenient even for a video game, I made my escape, Johnny in the voice inside my head sought refuge in a hotel, and Hanako suddenly had a change of heart and sent a robot to deliver her message for her. Did another oopsie with the mind melting just before blacking out and waking up in yet another hotel. Johnny promised to go to the recycling bin just as Old Yeller did if we got to Mikoshi, and he had a plan of his own. Adam Smasher needs to go but we'll need Rogue to make it happen, and she'll only listen to Johnny. I've been waiting for this for a long time. My task is to take drugs and OD. Surprisingly, only to those of you who haven't been paying attention, Johnny lied. There was heavy drinking, letting someone use his skin as a coloring book, drugs, violence, what looked like they could have been socks with sandals, a car crash, it was a wild time. At some point in the madness, I met with Rogue, convinced her of my plan, had to wait for Rogue to call, so I headed back out to the arid badlands because the Firestone Bounty Board has a new job for me. Pan Am wants to steal an armored military panzer tank because of course she does. Only six of us were in on the plan. There was no room for more at the picnic table. We rode to the interception point and began to lay our trap. First we broke into the control tower, then we restored power to the bitch, watched the big ass train move, she said some sh** that I reflected like a big f***ing emotionless mirror, and we headed back outside to get ready for the ambush. I jumped over her head as a shortcut 
managed to die by falling like 3 feet, last save was back outside when we first arrived at the station, and that was the end of that quest. I returned to the city to meet with Hanako at Embers. This is the end of the line. Once this quest begins, there is no going back. Hanako said that pretty much everyone in the upper echelon of her family tree knew about her brother's plot to take over the entire farm, but lacked the spine to do anything about it. But I'm living, breathing proof of his betrayal. All I've got to do is testify, and she'll take me to a Mikoshi access point in Mr. House's bunker below Arasaka Tower to get the chip safely removed. Unsure of what to do, side with the bitch or not, I took the elevator because I needed some air. Makes sense, I needed air, so I went to the most confined space in the entire building. One more blackout later, I was back at Vic's shop, and if you thought he was pessimistic the last time I got dragged in here, you ain't seen sh** yet. It's pretty much over for me. I said my last goodbye. He gave me a gun and some pills, and Misty led me up to the rooftop where she'd taken Jackie before he died. John and I had a chat. There was only one path forward. Only one more move left to make. No pills, no blaze of glory, just a bang that echoes through the city for a brief moment, then nothing. Remember when I said Pan Am would regret refusing my advances? She's mad at my suicide because she cared. She's sad. Her heart's broken. I win. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server by going to mitten.land. Follow me on Twitter, at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.